Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A while back, I was listening to a radio show, This American Life, and one of the stories was about a woman whose favorite movie was The Sound of Music. Now, she's not unique in that. The Sound of Music is a favorite movie for a lot of people. It's a classic. It is an all-time classic. But what was different was that this woman had only ever seen the first half of the movie. <laughs> See, back in the day, you had VHS tapes, and you would put the first one in, and then you had to put the second one in if it was a super long movie, like The Sound of Music, right? In the days before streaming, this was a thing. Well, apparently, this woman didn't realize there was a second tape. <laughs> so she had only ever seen the first half of the movie. And the first half, the first tape, tells the story of Maria being sent from the convent to the Von Trapp family. And, and really, the first half of the movie, it's, it's cheery and, and it's uplifting. You get these songs like uh, A Few of My Favorite Things and... Liesel and Rolf dance and sing, and the children bond with Maria, and everybody's happy, and the first half ends with Maria coming back from the convent, and everybody's reunited, and everybody's happy. Now, the woman who loved The Sound of Music somehow missed some rather obvious things that would stand out if you were watching it and knowing more of the full story, like, I don't know, the fact that Rolf was a Nazi. I mean, that, uh, that probably is going to stand out to you. She missed the backdrop of the story. So when a friend finally convinced her to watch the second half of the movie, they finally watched the second tape. She felt differently about the movie first half of the movie is really cheery and light. The second half is a lot darker. Uh, it's darker uh, cinematically. It is darker with some of the themes. There's more of an ominous feel to a lot of it. And after watching the rest of the movie, the woman decided, you know what? I liked it better the other way. I like just the first half. I don't want the rest of it. But I think we often approach the parable of the, parable of the prodigal son in a fairly similar way. The very title by which we call this parable, the prodigal son, it betrays this bias. The prodigal son is the first son. He's the one who brazenly tells his dad, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, which is a kind of a more polite way of saying, Dad, uh, if you were dead, it would be kind of nice because then I could have your stuff. The prodigal son is the one who, after receiving his share of the inheritance, takes off for a faraway country and wastes his inheritance on reckless living. The prodigal son is the one who, after wasting his inher inheritance, is humbled to the point of feeding pigs, which, in the context of the story, when Jesus is telling it to the people to whom he is speaking, is as low a job as could be imagined. Worse yet, the prodigal son longs for the food that the pigs have because he's so desperately hungry. The prodigal son is the one who comes to his senses, repents, and returns home and has this whole speech prepared to give to his father about how he sinned against heaven and against his father, but as he returns home, before he can even get a word out, the father sees him when he's a long way off. And the father runs to him, wraps his arms around him, hugs him, kisses him, and is rejoicing that his son is home. The prodigal son is the one who confesses to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son but the loving father doesn't listen to any of that. He doesn't disown him. He doesn't say, the best you can do is to be a servant in my house. The father says, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us celebrate. 
For this my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And here ends tape one, right? It's a complete story. It's an amazing story. You don't need anything more to it, but it's not the full story. To stop here would be to ignore the context in which Jesus tells the parable. This parable is not told by Jesus just kind of out of the blue. There's a context to it, and Luke gives us that context at the beginning of chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. There's the context. This is the reason Jesus tells the parable. The tax collectors and the sinners are grumbling because it doesn't seem right to them that this, this Jesus would be welcoming tax collectors and sinners. I mean, the Pharisees are just appalled by this. He, he eats with sinners. Can you believe this? So now we put in tape two and continue the rest of the story. And things get a little darker. We're not focused on the prodigal son anymore, but we're focused on his brother. And it begins, now, his older son. By the way, this just is an illustration that the parable really isn't about the prodigal son. It's about the loving father. Because who is the referent for the older son? Not the brother, but the father. Now his older son, right? So now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant, right? What's this celebration all about? Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. Again, the story centers on the father. He has received his son back safe and sound. The father rejoices. Well, what about the older son? He was angry and refused to go in. So the father actually comes out, and he's pleading with his older son to come and to celebrate. But the older son instead responds, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours... Notice, he doesn't say, this brother of mine, this son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, comes, you kill the fattened calf for him. Now, there's a lot going on with the older son. He's angry. He's angry with the father. He's angry with his brother. He doesn't feel that things are just. He doesn't feel he's getting what he deserves. But if you look a little more closely at the parable, there's, there's some things that are going to stand out for you. First is this. The older son already received his share of the inheritance too. You go back to verse 12. It says that the father divided the property between his sons. He already received from the father an inheritance. He's not lacking the father's already generously given to him. Number two, the older son in this setting would have probably received a lot more than the younger son in the inheritance. The way it usually worked in this context, in this, this time and place, the older son would receive double. So he's received his inheritance, probably double. And, and the third point is, is this. How does the older son know that the younger son has spent his money on prostitutes? <laughs> he doesn't. He's not even talked to him. He has either assumed this, assuming the worst of his brother, or he has dreamt of how he might use his money if he went wild, and he thought, well, that's, what, that's, probably, that's probably what I think I would do. I, I kinda, I'm kind of jealous that he's out there doing this. So the older son has received rich, great gifts from the father. The older son has uh, been blessed by the father, but the older son 
is resentful that he stayed home all this time. All of the work he's been doing, it's just been done out of obligation, not out of love. And this is why he's so unforgiving towards his brother. The older son actually envies his brother. But he feels trapped. He feels obligated to work. And there's no joy in the service that he's doing. He's just doing it because he feels like he has to. The attitude of the older son is the attitude of the Pharisees and scribes to whom Jesus was speaking. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Can you believe this? It also easily becomes our attitude, the attitude of those who have been in the church for a very, very long time. We begin to think we deserve special treatment. I mean, we've earned it. We've been here. We've put in the time. We've put in the hours. God owes me. And we begin to resent those who have fallen away and gone through a rebellious phase before coming back to the faith and being called back to the church by the Holy Spirit. In other words, tape two of the prodigal son is the tape that is most likely the one we should pay special attention to. Because we've been been the prodigal son, and God has welcomed us and forgiven our sins, but we've also been the older brother who begins to forget everything we have is a gift from the Father. And that the opportunity to serve the Father isn't some great burden, but it's a joy. In truth, we need both parts of the story, don't we? We need to hear of the love of the Father, the love of God who who rejoices when sinners return to him. And he he welcomes them, and he puts a a robe and a ring on them, and he, he makes them his children once again. The second a tape we need, though, because we don't want to become like the scribes and the Pharisees who think that we are better than others and deserve things from God. Because salvation is always a gift. Our status as children of God is always a gift. It is by grace, through faith in Jesus, not by works. So we don't have anything to boast about except Jesus. So to close today, I want to to ask you to join me in prayer. and We want to ask God to help us not to become prideful like that older son, but also we want to give thanks for him welcoming us back into the family, forgiving us and putting a robe and a ring on us and making his children once again. We pray. Heavenly Father, it is fitting to celebrate for we were dead in sin, and you have made us alive in Christ. Keep us from the kind of sinful pride shown by the older brother in the parable that instead we would join in the celebration whenever any sinner returns to you. Remind us that we were lost, but you found us, that we were dead, but you have made us alive in Christ by baptism and faith. Keep us from sinful pride and instead give us hearts that are filled with thanksgiving and love for the lost. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.